All right, turn your Bibles to Second Peter chapter 3, please. And uh, we're going to talk about Darwinian evolution again. Um, we're going to talk about Darwin's bulldog. Darwin's bulldog, Thomas Huxley, evolution, his, evo- his evolutionary theories, and, and the Illuminati Royal Society that he was connected to. Second Peter chapter 3, yes. And it's important that we understand that Darwin was, not, Darwin was not a brave man. He was a coward. Darwin brought about all these, popularized these theories, brought them out. But really, the bulldog, the, one, the evangelist or the apostle, so to speak, that drove them all home was Thomas Huxley. He was the one that really pushed everything. He was the one that pushed the envelope of, of, uh, of evolution. And he used some Gestapo techniques to do it. And they still use those same Gestapo techniques today to try to drown out any creationism. If anyone ever challenges Darwinian evolution, well, the first thing that they do is use these techniques that Darwin or that, that Thomas Huxley used to bully the people of England and bully anybody in any scientific education or anything like that. These are the tactics that they used, these tactics. And I'm going to share with you some of those tactics here and explain to you who this man was. Because I think... You know, there's a great disconnect. A lot of people, first of all, don't study history. Okay? They don't have a clue what went on or what has went on in history with evolution or any of these other things. They take it and they just say, oh, well, okay, there was Darwin preached, Darwin taught evolution, and this is just how it happened. Well, what is it all connected to? What's the Luciferian satanic connection with all this? And is there one? Or was evolution just something that was brought up on its own that really just man just thought up and has nothing to do with the devil? Well, no, we know that it's been taught in the Garden of Eden that it was taught that ye shall be God that you, you shall ascend, you know, you'll be gods. And, and that was the promise that he gave to Eve. So it's Lucifer's promise all over again. And you have to deny the God of the Bible to accept evolution. You have to. The first step in receiving evolution is to deny the God of the Bible and his authority. You have to do that. But it's important that you explain this to people, that it is a religion. Evolution is a religion. When you talk to them, they have to, you have to explain them. It is. There, it is a faith-based religion. It certainly is. But it's a state-funded faith-based religion. It is funded by the state. And it's pushed, and it's given grants, and it's given money, and it's given notoriety. And, it, and, and what they do is, is they stomp out any type of con- anything that competes with Darwinian evolution, that questions natural selection, that questions anything, they, they, put a stomp, they stomp it right away. They marginalize, ridicule, and do whatever they can. Why? Because they have to. They have to. Because the theory cannot stand on its own. It just cannot. Why? Because it's stupid. I'm sorry, but it's just stupid. Plain stupid. That's all that it is. It doesn't even make any sense. You're asking me to believe that soup produced all these things. But you think it's funny when I say that, no, the God of heaven made all these things. So I'm supposed to believe soup, and you can believe, and, or I can believe God, but you can believe soup, but then your soup theory is just much more highly intelligent than having an intelligent creator that created all things. It's all powerful, all knowing. Right? So you're just dumb, you know. You're, so they try to turn around you and make you feel stupid. These evol- they try. No, no, your theory is stupid. I'm sorry, it's stupid. You know, because basically, here's the theory. Okay, this this cup right here can never turn into this cell phone on its own like this. Okay, it won't just happen, right? But give it a million years, and this cup could become this cell phone. Now, I know that's not exactly the same, but it's pretty much the same. That's, that's pretty much what they're saying. If you add a couple million years to anything, it can become something else. Do you, that, that's what they're saying. That's right. If you, yeah, that's the missing link. If you add a couple million years or a couple, or a couple billion years to anything, it'll become something else. That's stupid. It doesn't even make any common sense at all. But this theory is so dangerous that it's promoted the most wicked atrocities in this world. Absolutely wicked atrocities. All right, so Second Peter chapter 3, verse number 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, 
walking after their own lusts. We've seen that last night, too. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. What do they do? They deny the flood, right? They deny the coming of the Lord. They deny the flood. But the heavens and earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved by the, excuse me, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. What is this? This is the beginning. You see the beginning of creation in this verse, in these verses. You see the destruction, the fall of man in these verses. We see the flood in these verses. And then what do you see also? You see the coming of the Lord and the destruction, the coming judgment. It's all right there, isn't it? By the way, that's, that's pretty much everything that you and I are supposed to preach. All of those things. The beginning, the creation, right? The fall of man, the flood, and the coming judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what, that's, that's what we're here to preach. We're here to warn them. Amen? We're here to warn them. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I pray that you'd help us now as we go through this, Lord. I know there's a bunch of facts and things like this, Lord, but these men need to be exposed for who they really are. People need to understand, Lord, there's law, there are lost sinners out there that are just on the verge. They know something's not right with evolution. They know something doesn't make sense. Lord, I pray that they would hear these sermons. I pray that we would be able to take these materials and help them that are out there, Lord, to use them, Lord, that you would use this. Lord, to open some eyes up to some people that, have, that are stuck in this, that believe this fairy tale of evolution. And Lord, that they would receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. It's interesting. Note, one thing that I forgot about that, um, that's a piece of information that was found that I want to kind of bring up here because it kind of segues into this. Some important fact about Darwin that, that I missed that was in like, I believe it was in the Evolution Cruncher. I think, um, handbook that was there. Uh, and, and I want to give you this fact because it's important. Remember we talked about Darwin and, his, and how he was probably devil-possessed. You know, there was a missing point here that I didn't get that Brother Nate actually found in that Evolution Cruncher book. And, uh, and I, I thought it was important to put this in here because it kind of ties it all in together. It, it makes you really realize who Charlie Darwin really was. I want to read this to you. Before concluding this section, it is of interest that certain men in history have deeply hated God. And then engaging in spiritism, having been used of Satan to produce evil teachings that have destroyed large numbers of people or engage in warfare that annihilated millions. In connection with this, we think of men like Sigmund Freud and Adolf Hitler. It is not commonly known that Charles Darwin, while a naturalist aboard the Beagle, was initiated into witchcraft in South America by natives. He took part in their ceremonies and as a result... Something happened to him. It was after his return to England that he feverishly began researching and working with others in an effort to destroy faith in God. Satan not only entered his mind, but affected his body as well. Charles Darwin, following his journey on the HMS Beagle, developed a chronic and incapacitating illness characterized by lassitude, palpitations, headaches, sleeplessness, and tremulousness. There has been much speculation concerning the underlying cause of these symptoms, Analysts have seen them as psychosomatic. Random house encyclopedia, so hardly from a Baptist preacher. Okay. Another strange fact is that in the later years, Darwin would sadly remark that he could no longer appreciate beautiful music. He went to his deathbed under a depression that he could not shake. So then, so, so you see, <laughs> that's an important piece of the puzzle there. Darwin was hanging out with a bunch of natives, and he was initiated into the craft, running around with a bunch of, a bunch of Hindus out there, a bunch, or a bunch of uh, a voodoo uh, people that were into voodoo and witchcraft out there in the middle of nowhere, and he probably got himself a couple demons while he was on the way. Well, he already was primed for the devils, wasn't he? He already had a bunch of stuff going on. He already hated God as it was. He was already a skeptic against God. Amen? So he just talked those demons. You know, he never lost those demons either. He had them until the day he died. Mm-hmm. So then in comes Darwin's bulldog, a wicked man by the name of Huxley, Thomas Huxley, who was a great evangelist for evolution and Darwin. But his grandsons, which we'll talk about the next hour, would, be, would do even more damage than he did. 
as Charles did more damage than his grandfather had done. You know, it's important how you train your children. If you train them right, they'll do more for the Lord than you ever did. If you train them wrong, they'll curse the, their, the, you'll curse the day they were born, or they will, one of the two. But you'll hate everything that ever happened. Mm-hmm. That's why we have to train them in this book. Amen? That's why we train them in this book. Why? Because we want them to be ten times greater and do greater things than we've ever done. Amen? Amen? That's what we want to send them out in the world. It's also known that Dr. Thomas Henry Huxley, a fellow of the Royal Society and a Freemason, encouraged Charles Darwin to put his theory into paper. Later, Huxley would become the official spokesman for Darwin. All right, so first off, I want to explain to you that, they were, that this man, Thomas Huxley, this promoter, this evangelist of evolution, Thomas Huxley, was a member of the Royal Society. Now, you have to understand something. These Freemasons, we've already talked about Freemasonry here, not extensively, but enough for you to understand what Freemasonry is. It's Lucifer is the light of the lodge, right? We get that, right? We understand that. Lucifer is the light of the lodge. So you either worship the Lord Jesus Christ or you worship the devil. I don't care what face the devil takes on. It's still the devil. You understand that? That's the difference. There is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And then there is the devil. And there is his worship. There is the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And there is the spirit, there's the spirit of righteousness that comes in the saints of God. Amen. That's what it is. There's only one spirit. There's only two spirits in the world. That's it. One is of God, the other of the devil. It's the mystery of iniquity versus the mystery of godliness. That's the way it's always been. I don't care what face you put on it. You can put a black face on it like last night was on it. It's still antichrist. And I told those wicked devils that too. You're a bunch of antichrist devils. You got devils in you. You preach against Jesus, the Bible says you're antichrist. And let him be accursed. Amen. It's plain truth. So this mem- they were me- he was members of the they were members of the royal society. It's not difficult to understand why Huxley devoted all of his efforts to promote evolution when his organizational links are taken into account. Huxley was actually a member. See, listen, you're going to do what you believe in, right? Well, okay, let's look at it. What are, what, what are my connections here? Who do I hang out with? What do I believe in? What do I follow? This book, God's people, God's men, we go out. We, here, here's our connections. This is who we are, right? So where can you find us? Well, on Saturday nights, you, Saturday nights or Friday nights, sometimes you'll find us on the street corners preaching the Word of God. On Wednesday night, you'll find us at church. You'll find us with the saints of God. On Sunday, you'll find us assembling together with the saints of God at church. Amen. You'll find us together sitting as the church. Amen. And, and living and loving God. You'll find us doing that. Why? Because that's who we are. That's who we identify with. So our identifications and who we identify with it, it tends to lead to, well, how do they practice? And if you did an investigation, you've seen it, you would understand, hey, these people are saints. These people follow Jesus Christ. They follow the word of God. So then what are their activities? To promote the word of God. Who do these people follow? The Masonic Order, the Masonic Lodge. So who are they going to follow? Their God. And what does their God teach them? Evolution. It's pretty simple. Pretty simple. I'm not going to allow those evolutionary people to try to, to, try to uh, put any other face on it but the devil's face. Rip off the face of Darwin and just tell the truth. You're a bunch of devils. You follow a bunch of devils. You follow, the, you, you follow a religion of devils. That's what you follow. You follow Lucifer. How do I know that? Because he's the one that you get your information from. He's the one that you modeled everything after. He's the one that your founders modeled it. You know, isn't it amazing how these guys, in all these cults, no matter what it is, evolution is just like a cult. In, in all these cults, what they do is the Mormons try to distance themselves from the crazy teachings of Joseph Smith. Hey, he's a Masonic mystic witch. You can't do that. Right? The Seventh-day Adventists. They try to distance themselves, and they're a bunch of men that walk around like this, limp-wristed, bunch of the fruitiest men I've ever seen in my life. I mean, eat some steak, man, or something, please. Just get some, you don't, and I don't really care if anybody gets offended by this, because you go out there and watch these people. They walk around like a bunch of girls, and the girls walk around butch! And it's just, it's just, and the women run around running everything. And oh, it gets, don't talk like that. Why? Because I sound like a man. Oh my goodness. Does it frighten you that I actually sound like a man? I actually believe it. I actually believe that men should be different than women and actually walk around and be men and stand up like men. 
Mike, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so they follow Ellen G. White. Yeah, their founder. What's that? Enough said, yeah. That went up. Anyway, I don't even need to go into that any further. But you have the JWs, and you have what they follow. And, but they try to distance themselves from the crazy teachings of these men. You can't. They're your founders. This is what you people believe. Own it. Own it. We have no problem owning what this book says. Our founder is Jesus Christ. Yeah, Jesus founded the Baptist church. (gasps) Oh, that's just so offensive, isn't it? Not really. I kind of like it. But anyway, um, it's his church. Amen. Amen. And those baptized believers... Yeah, yeah, try, could you please try to find an earthly founder to the Baptist church? Still looking. They're still looking. Believe me, they're looking. They try to pin it on guys like John Smith. They try to pin it on all these people. They, they try to pin it on wherever they can try to find it. And they just can't nail one down. I know you can't. Because it goes back to the Bible. It's the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Amen. Anyway, so they try to, you can't distance yourself from Freemasonry if you're, if you believe in evolution. Why? Because Freemasonry promoted evolution. It pushed it. It taught it. Freemasons. It was all their organization. All right. Huxley was actually a member of the Royal Society, one of the most important scientific institutions of England. He was also a senior Mason, just like all the other members of Royal Society. Oh, well, that's, that's an accident, right? That wouldn't be I mean, there's no way, right? That has to be an accident, right? Like, it wouldn't just happen that all the members of the Royal Society would be high-level Freemasons. And they'd be very wealthy, they'd be very influential, and they would control the scientific world. No, that's just a coincidence, right? No, I don't think it's a coincidence. Other members of the Royal Society advanced explicitly and in detail the alternative theory of natural selection foreshadowed by Erasmus Darwin. Grandpa... He provided considerable support to they provided provided uh, considerable support to Darwin both before and after the publication of his book. This Freemasonic institution attached so much importance to Darwin and Darwinism that sometime later, just like Nobel prizes, they began to award successful scientists with the Darwin Medal. How would you like the Darwin? Hi, I'm I won the Darwin. That's just stupid. Anyway, in other words, Darwin was not alone to carry out his mission. Freemasonry, one of the most important headquarters of the war, waged against religion, provided its full support to the theory from the day it was put forth. And but you didn't know that, did you? Oh, no, Freemasons, they're just a bunch of good guys. They hate Jesus Christ. Yep. Who, do you th- who do you think it is they're trying to raise up? Who's coming up? Who's it? You, think, you really think it's Jesus Christ? You think when these people say, the Christ, they're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ in the Bible? No, they're talking about Antichrist. They're talking about Antichrist. It's exactly what they're talking about. Better believe it. Anyway, they waged their war. Freemasonry has always had a war against biblical faith. Always. Never forget that. No matter how many of these, these Masons that are Baptists and all these people, they come together and they do this. And the Southern Baptist Convention, they're, they're, why do you think the Southern Baptist Convention is so liberal? Could it be the thousands of Masons that are in there? Yep. The theory of evolution, <clears throat> evolution, despite the lack of conviction it created among a lot of people when it was first asserted, gained immense popularity in a few decades by the ideological support it received. Darwinianism, of course, refers to Charles Darwin, the man most effective in achieving a widespread belief in one life, and that's it. He suggested in the mid-1800s that the potential of the mind is developed by genetic inheritance. This is patent nonsense, but it did provide the justification for the eugenics racial purity movement that would follow and lead both to Adolf Hitler and the population control policies of today. By the way... I can promote this show now. Look at this. <laughs> we just did a show, Brother Nate and I, on population control, and it is long. So sit down, Brother Russ, and you, have to, you, you can play it at work while you're running around for three hours there at 3 o'clock in the morning and not sleeping because you're watching things, okay? But it's, it's long. It's three hours long. I mean, it's long, but it's Nate's fault because he had 17 pages of notes. So blame him for it. But anyway... Um, but it, it was good, and it explains population, the, the population, um, 
the depopulation and, and just their goal. Right, right. It just explains it very thoroughly. The history of it, where it came from, <clears throat> and it just so it, it just so incidentally it just comes right back to where we are today. Evolution. Yeah, but they don't. They want to murder your children. What's that? That's right. They hate God. They love death. That's right. Okay, so his work, Origin of Species, to give it a shortened title, and we'll give you the real title, was to become the basis for scientific thinking, and its mindset dominates what we bravely call science to this day. His most famous theory, that of the survival of the fittest, didn't even appear in the first four editions. He lifted it from the writings of contemporary Herbert Spencer. (coughs) Excuse me. Who had lifted it from someone else. The word evolution did not appear until the sixth edition. I understand that even in 1872, and even Darwin didn't believe his theory fully uh, by the end of his life, and he thought God created human beings. So I don't know if that's true or not, because I don't really believe that, because Darwin never said that, but this is what this writer says. Um, I don't think, I think Darwin could not deny that God created human beings, and that's why it tortured him for his whole life, the rest of his life. But he would not accept the God that created mankind. But his own origin of species went on to take over scientific thought anyway. It was designed by the elite to do just that. Darwin was another stooge. Sure was. He was the front man for a coup on the, ma- on the human mind, which was coordinated over many years. A small group of people known as the Lunar Society, we talked about this in Birmingham, Birmingham England, was a significant in this. The group continued its influence under the name, the London-based Royal Society, which is still one of the most influential bodies in the world with regard to science. They still control science, basically. Do you understand that? They get grant money, they get millions of dollars from different uh, organizations, everything. They still run, they still run society, run, run the science and, uh, run science. The Royal Society was founded by the Order. Okay, are you ready for this? Are you ready? By the Order of the Rosy Cross in the reign of Charles II. The Rosicrucians, that's right. Now, some of you don't know who the Rosicrucians are. They're kind of, aren't they an offshoot of the Knight Templar? Or are they kind of like just the same thing pretty much? I mean, they're just, there's all, what's that? Pretty close to an offshoot of the Knight, of, of the, of the, um, yeah, exactly. So, so, in other words, they're just ancient Masons, really, older Masons. Basically, same mystery religion, same mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of all harlots, connected to it all. Um, same thing. Okay, the Royal Society was founded by the Order of the Rosy Cross in the reign of Charles. So what would a bunch of people, a bunch of God-hating Illuminists, be doing controlling all of science? Well, folks, that's how it's always been pretty much. That's how it's always been. These people are a bunch of devil possessed, but nobody wants to trace this history back and really talk about it. Why? Because once you start tracing it back, you got to make a decision, friend. You're either with Lucifer or you're with Jesus. And that's the only choice you have. And I'm telling you what, if you believe in evolution, you better think again, pal. It was forged in the mind of a cultist of these Illuminists, of these mystery religions. That's what it is. Oh, I don't believe in a God. Oh, yes, you do. You believe in the God of this world. You're just blinded by him. You're just completely blinded by him. So let me pull off the mask and show you who it really is. Because that's who developed evolution right there. That's who promoted it, and that's who pushed it. Why? Because they hate God. It's plain and simple. They hate the Lord. That's all there is to it. That's what it is. Another famous scientific influence, Sir Isaac Newton was a Rosicrucian and Grand Master of the Priory of Zion, the inner core of the Knights Templar. It was in the inspiration behind the founding of the Royal Society. Researchers into the background of the Lunar Society have shown that it mirrored with remarkable accuracy a group called the Invisible College, described in the Francis Bacon work, The New Atlantis. Oh, Shakespeare, Francis Bacon, yeah, that's a whole other story. Wait a minute, are you saying that this... Go- does anybody has anybody ever read the New Atlantis or looked at it or watched a documentary on it? I have. I've watched Chris Pinto's documentary on the New Atlantis, America, the New Atlantis. See, these occultists had forged that they had in their mind this vision that America was the New Atlantis. It would be the land where they would do everything they wanted to do. In essence, it's the same thing as mystery ba- it's, it's promoting mystery babylon it's basically the same thing okay but if you have you seen that video brother you need I, i'll send it to you brother paul you need to watch that you would you would enjoy that except there's parts of it that you wouldn't enjoy because for some reason chris pinto likes to leave out baptist and i think we know why chris pinto leaves out baptist 
Yeah, that's right. That's one reason. The other reason is they don't want to talk about the persecution of the Baptists, and they want to say that America was founded completely by the Illuminati, which is not true. It's not true. And if you've been following the Baptist battle for liberty, that's the whole reason why I'm doing the show, because we're, we're moving our way to America. And as we get there, I am showing every single time that God raised up Baptist to have governments that had liberty of conscience, that allowed freedom of religion, liberty of conscience. If you haven't listened to those, go back and listen to those shows. You're going to find out that there were nations that were 150 years or, or cities or, or controlled government areas where governments were that they governed these people. And they were free. And they said, and what happens when they had liberty of conscience? They sent out missionaries all over the world. How about that? And they started churches everywhere. And then Rome got sick and tired of that. So what did they do? Come in and kill everybody. But that Chris Pinto leaves that out. Well, number one, I think he's ignorant of some of the history. And he's a Calvinist, and well, there's other reasons. And they, they like they're into that um, uh, Dominion theology. So they want to. They're just they were waiting to pull the sword out. Anyway, so it was known as the Lunar Society because it met once a month at the time of the full moon. Among its members, and we this is a little bit of backup. Back, I know we talked about this a little bit, but I'll, I'll get through this. Just get, bear with me here. Among its members were Benjamin Franklin, one of the founders of the United States and close associate of French revolutionaries. See, old Benji didn't get accomplished in America what he wanted. See, Benji and the boys, what they wanted to do was they, they wanted to turn this thing into a big old Illuminati thing. And they, 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 didn't, they didn't understand, though, that God had some men here, some people here that stood up. And that God had some men here that, that, that brought the truth. God had a remnant here, and this nation became a Baptist nation. Amen. Although there was that Illuminati fight always, but guess what, friend? There's always been the mystery of iniquity versus the mystery of godliness. It's always been there. Nothing's new. That's, that's not new. That's always been that way. That's right. But there's a remnant. And that's what, that's what Benjamin and Thomas and all those men didn't account for. They didn't, they didn't, and they didn't account for men like, like um, you know, George Whitfield. Even though Benjamin Franklin said he knew George Whitfield, I mean, he knew who he was, everything. He went to some of his meetings and, he was, and, and everything like that. He never got saved. Benjamin Franklin was a wicked man. Of course, you didn't have the Internet back then, so it wasn't like Whitfield and those guys could go online and look up Benjamin Franklin's... Uh, what he was up to. <laughs> it wasn't work that way. These guys were spies and double spies, and I mean, they were just unbelievable. Anyway, Erasmus Darwin, the grandfather of Charles Darwin, the man who would later be the front man for the world, is all there is. What a coincidence. Another member of the Lunar Society was a Unitarian, Josiah Wedgwood, founder of the famous pottery, and his daughter was to become the mother of Charles Darwin after she married Dr. Robert Darwin. It's the son of Erasmus Darwin. Nothing like keeping it in the family. Now, these people were kind of weird, okay, because Darwin had some kids. He married his first cousin, I believe, um, and they had some problems. Like, the kids had some problems. Yeah, but that doesn't surprise me any. Uh, anyway, six of the Lunar Society members were educated at Edinburgh University, as was Charles Darwin. The Society was a revolutionary organization which supported the overthrowing of the monarchies and the undermining of God in the human belief system. Benjamin Franklin became a sort of shuttle diplomat for the cause in the same way that Henry Kissinger would come to be in the second half of this century. So Benjamin Franklin, what was he doing? He was going back and forth, causing trouble. They were all part of the French Revolution, okay? They were part of that. They just forgot about God when it came to America. That's what changed. That's what made it different. All right. I can, uh, this author says, I cannot recommend too highly the book of the Canadian scientist and researcher Ian Taylor called In the Minds of Men, Darwin and the New World Order. So if you want to do some studying on that, I might pick up that book too, but Darwin and the New World Order. This reveals the story of how modern scientific theory was manufactured and sold as truth to mislead the human mind. With detailed documented evidence, Taylor dismantles the edifice of the scientific establishment, its beliefs and its claims. Anyway, so you can find that information in that book. Um, and I, David Cloud quotes that book a lot, too, from his research with that. So it, it appears it has a lot, a lot of information there. All right, number two, Thomas Huxley, Darwin's bulldog for evolution. Thomas Huxley was called Darwin's bulldog because he was the premier public defender of Darwinian evolution in Darwin's day. Whereas Charles Darwin was reclusive and mild-tempered, Huxley was combative and loved the limelight. Never one to enter the public fray. Darwin needed a champion as Huxley needed a cause. Desmond Huxley, page 260 of his book. Huxley's biographer says he lived in a fantasy world as a child. 
He never stopped living in that fantasy world. He stayed living in it. Evolution is fantasy world. Escaping into a secret realm of science. His great influences were skeptics, such as Unitarians, who were developing new forms of knowledge based on natural causes rather than Anglican miracles. Okay, let me help you out with something. I'm going to give you an example of this. You want to talk about some vain religion? You want to, you want to know something that will kill the faith of somebody when they are challenged by this world and challenged by all the wickedness of this world? Just walk down the hall a little bit, okay? And watch them as they walk up to a picture and they do all this. And they kiss that picture and they, they touch their toes and they, they do the hokey pokey and they turn themselves around. And that's what it's all about. Okay? I know. Pastor, stop being sarcastic. Just change. Would you just be nicer like all the other preachers? Yeah, well, then I'd be dead like most of them are too. But um, <laughs> you wouldn't have anything to listen to. Um, that's what they do, right? That's the stuff they do right there. Okay, now. What do you think that's going to do to the faith of one of these kids when the world is presented to them when they get old enough? And if that's what they think the, the, the biblical faith is, what's going to happen to them? Man, they will turn to anything besides that. They'll hate God. Well, that's a bunch of fake, phony, stupid stuff is what that is. What, what am I kissing some stupid picture for anyway? What am I doing that for? Right? Why am I doing that? Why is that so vain, empty religion? Why? That's what, that's what the Unitarianism, the Anglicanism of that day, those people that they were fighting, that's what the, that's what the, the, faith, that's what the faith was. Well, if you try to match that with Darwinian evolution, the fact that, hey, you can do whatever you want to do. There's no rules, baby. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Just have a good time. What are you going to choose? Are you going to choose that old dead, dry orthodoxy that can't save a man, can't lift him out of the gutter and bring him up? You, you, you're not going to, you're not going to go, nah, you're going to walk away from that. You're going to be like, this is stupid. Well, that's what it does to these people. That's what happened to these guys. That's what happened in England. It was dead. It was spiritually dead for the most part. In a lot of places, oh, we had Spurgeon there and other men that were preaching and, you know, J.C. Ryle and some other men that were preaching and um, uh, Joseph... I can't think of his last name right now. I've got a big set from him. Uh, a man named Joseph that, that uh, he preached, and he preached pretty strong. And, and I, uh, you know, he was, but there were some, but for the most part, when they were stuck in those Anglican dead churches, no power. No power. None. At age 12, Huxley was deeply influenced by James Hutton, Theory of the Earth. Or that, those long geological periods. I'm telling you, that book has been referenced a lot, has impacted a lot of people. Which denied the Bible's account of the creation of the flood. As a teenager, he spent Sundays arguing metaphysics with skeptics such as George May. It was May who introduced Huxley to Southwood Smith's divine government, which was the Unitarian Bible. These influences rejected the divinity of Christ and the miracles of the Bible. Right, yeah, they are. Well, what happens when you deny the divinity of Christ? Romans chapter 1 happens. That's what happens. Look at these guys out there. Uh, last night, these black Hebrew Israelis, what are they doing? Denying the divinity of Christ. They said, he's not God. Jesus isn't God. And then we showed him 1 Timothy uh, chapter, or is it 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16. 1 Timothy chapter 3, 16. We showed him those verses. You know what he said? Well, see, Henry, he, said, he told that guy, and he gave him this verse, he said, Ye shall be as gods. I said, you know, and, and he starts quoting this verse that or, I have said ye are all gods when, when, when Jesus said that or whatever. And I said, yeah, that's little g. That's not God. And then he said I was Esau and I was an Edomite. I'm a Kuliite. I'm not an Edomite. What? Yeah, he said white people are Edomites, and he's Israel. He said, you're the red people, or something, I don't know. You came out red and hairy, or something, I don't know. Yeah, he said the Gentiles were black people that don't know they're Israelites, that's what he said. I seriously almost want to do a video about that guy. I, I, I kind of do. I think I'm going to. 
Anyway, all right. At the and I'm going to put it with his name in it and everything, so everybody can see it. This guy's a big phony. He's a liar. He's a racist, bait, baiting, hateful monger. I'm going to do that. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Okay. Anyway, that's another story for another day. At age 12, Huxley. Okay, he was deeply influenced by that. We read that already. Okay, but the, what does the Bible say about this? For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that was then being overflowed with water perished. The world perished, right? Huxley had fleeting fears that skepticism would destroy the moral fiber of society. Why'd you push it then? Because you had devils, that's why. And those fears have proven true, but his conscience was hardened. And by age 17, he became a long-haired radical. Rome, anything to rebel against God. Evolution, just anything to rebel against God. Romans chapter 2, verse number 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. another. What was he doing? Listen to me. Darwin did it. He did it. They had to sin against the light of conscience. And that's what drove them insane. They had to continue to sin against the light of conscience. Because they knew even the little bit of Bible that they had, which was very little, they knew that inward light of conscience that they had would not shut out the God of the Bible. Would not put out the flames of the God. Would not quench the flames of the truth. They knew there was a God. And they fought it. So they sinned. These men knew what would happen if they followed this path. And they were warned, by the way, but turned their back on God and became reprobates, rejected by God. In 1855, he married Henrietta Nettie Heathorne. She was a pious Anglican, and their discussions on religion were conducted under a dark cloud. Well, no kidding. You know, I mean, did, did the Anglicans not understand to preach that you don't marry unbelievers? I mean, what, what's the deal with these people? I mean... Well, that's okay. Baptists don't really preach much of it anymore either. So, He freely expressed his doubts about Genesis myths, he called them, and miraculous interventions, afterlife and atonement. And when he attended church with her, he was always foul-tempered and considered the preaching the greatest absurdities. All of this worried her deeply. In one letter, she wrote the following pathetic words. I am often very unhappy about his sentiments. I have such need of leading unto holy things that I fondly hoped he would have been the guide and instructor into more perfect ways. But here my hopes have borne bitter fruit. Something has come over me of late. I cannot pray as fervently as I did. What happened to her? Well, I don't think she was saved, okay? But what happened to her? She married a man who was a skeptic, and let that be a lesson to everyone. The Bible's very clear about not being unequally yoked together. That's why fathers have a responsibility to make sure who their daughters marry, that they marry God-fearing holy men, amen, that love the Lord. And if they don't, then you don't marry them to them. You don't. And you make sure of it. You do the work. Listen, as this church grows and God blesses it, uh, or if it doesn't grow and God still blesses it, either way, as it does, you know, it's not the pastor's duty to run around and make sure who your daughters marry is the right person. It's your responsibility. And I believe, according to scriptures, I have, ta- I have taught you and showed you your responsibility. Amen? And Brother Russ has taught it and showed it as well. And you men understand your responsibility. Now, I mean, if I seen something that was concerning, I would come to you privately and tell you. I owe you that. Amen? That's right. But at the end of the day, you, Dad, vet the person that marries your daughter. And may I say very critically, too. Mm-hmm. According to the scriptures, very closely. Yeah, yeah, right. But she married a man who was a skeptic. When his first son died at age four, the grieving Huxley rejected the idea that he needed the hope and consolation of Christ and considered the temptation to turn to such a hope a scoffing devil. Hmm. Oh, no, evolution, they're not God-haters. Yes, they are. That's right, who are the haters? When the preacher read about the bodily resurrection from 1 Corinthians 15 at the funeral, Huxley said, they shocked me, and I could have laughed with scorn. 
Well, first of all, I wouldn't have read it. If that's the case, this guy's a mocker and a scoffer and hates Jesus Christ. His children are raised that way. How can you talk about the hope of the resurrection? <laughs> right? Calling good evil and evil good, Huxley claimed that biblical faith is the unpardonable sin. What a messed up, mixed up mind of devils. I told you evolution was stupid. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. What was he? Scoffer walking after his own lust. No rational man cognizant of the facts believes that the average Negro. Okay, I got, I got to get this. I got, I got to set this up here. I, I think maybe, maybe the black Hebrew Israelites should read some of this, and they would know that we don't hate them like they hate us. But Darwin hated them. Huxley hated them. Always have and always will. No rash. Darwin and Huxley, they were evolutionary racists. And he wrote this. No rational man, cognizant of the facts, believes that the average Negro is the equal, still less the superior of the white man. Lay's Sermons and Addresses and Reviews, 1871, page 20. Huxley argued that regardless of what privileges are given to the black man, he will not be able to compete successfully with his bigger-brained and smaller-jawed rival Caucasians in a contest which is to be carried on by thoughts and not by bites. Mm -hmm. See it? Mm -hmm. This is evolution, friend. This is evolution. Oh, I know. Those professors look so proper and nice and kind, and they're just wanting to teach you everything, and they want to save you from the bondage of religion and everything else. Meanwhile, they'll treat black people and others, and they know the truth of it. They can try to distance themselves, but they're a bunch of devils that would murder all of them. They had the opportunity. Hitler did. Okay, here's another one. Listen to this one. Oh, they wouldn't murder people, would they? Well, let's see. On a visit to New Guinea, Huxley decided that it would be good if the Aborigines were wiped out. Their elimination from the Earth's surface can be viewed only with satisfaction as the removal of a great blot from the eschaton of our common humanity. Adrian Desmond, Huxley, page 144. So Darwinian evolutions evangelists go out and preach, murder all the people, murder all the aborigines. The gospel of Jesus Christ preaches, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. Which ones mean? Who loves death? All they that hate God. All they that hate God love death. Mm-hmm. He goes on to say this, every thinking man I have met with, it, with is at heart in a state of doubt on all the great points of religious faith. Well, I'm not. You never met me, so you never met any true Christians then. And the unthinking men are in as complete a state of practical unbelief. Huxley, 1851. Huxley counted radical steps, radical skeptics such as Herbert Spencer, John Stuart Mill, and George Holyoke, and George Eliot among his best friends. Secularity was their watchword. They wanted a hammer to break the creationist shackles. That is, break their bands asunder, right? And Darwinianism became the hammer. It was also described as a cleansing solvent, dissolving the dross of biblical miracles. Now, years later, oh, evolution and Christianity, they can coincide together. No, they can't. No, they can't. You people love death. That's why you want to depopulate the world. That's why you want to depopulate the world by six billion, six and a half billion people. You bunch of lying devils. You bunch of wicked apostate. You bunch of wicked devil-possessed people. You're lying. You're absolute liars. You want to murder everyone. You want to kill, kill, kill. That's what you want to do. Because you're of your father, the devil. The lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. Bunch of liars. I'm telling you what, you listen to that population control, uh, sir, uh, 
radio show that we just that we just did. Aaron will get it on later on, probably sometime tonight or something. I'm guessing when he gets that on there, you listen to that show. It might take you a couple of days. Some of you that don't have the same time to sit down or whatever, but you listen to that show, and man, I'll tell you what, it, it'll get you angry. You'll get mad when you think about how these people just want to go in and murder people and kill them all. Men like Ted Turner and other men like that that just want to wipe them all out. And their and their and their one child policies and their two child policies that we paid for in China, we paid for them. We paid for them. Mm -hmm. The extermination of life. But they want to save the whales, save the ponies, and the bears. But kill the babies, kill the people. Because they're of the devil. Huxley thrived in the, in the sea, uh, sea mist of rationalism and became one of the prominent voices in England for the overthrow of the Christian faith. He called Darwinism, Darwinism the new reformation. Huxley wanted to see the foot of science on the necks of her enemies. And his children, the evolutionary faith, have lived to see that dream fulfilled to a great degree. Huxley boasted, science and her methods gave me a resting place independent of authority and tradition. Independent of authority. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? I'm telling you, evolution is wicked. That's why this series is called The Evils of Evolution, because it is evil. It is evil. Huxley eventually attacked the resurrection of Christ. Well, of course you have to attack the resurrection of Christ because it's the power of God. The Evolution of Theology, he called it, which was published in 19th Century Magazine. Huxley claimed that Jehovah God was a product of evolution. He blasphemy hated the Elohim ghost deity of the Old Testament who policed moral behavior with promises of rewards and threats of unearthly torment. It is obvious that he did not understand either God or his gospel. Huxley called the accounts of Jesus casting out the demons in Gadara preposterous and immoral. Well, yeah, because you want to keep your demons. You don't want them out of you. They control you. He claimed that Jesus was just another Orthodox Jewish teacher. He called Paul's theology Neoplatonic. I can't even say that word. Yeah, what's that mean? I don't know either. I don't really care, but whatever. What's that? Huxley's largest book, Controverted Questions, was on biblical criticism. Huxley even compared his, with churches, competed directly with churches through his Sunday evenings for the people lectures. These were even given re- religious-like trappings. Huxley would enter with Hayden's creation blasting from a church organ to heighten the sense of awe. Huxley's lecture was enthusiastic and sermon-like. His God was the unknown. His faith was man. His Bible was science. His gospel was, was scientific achievement instead of divine purpose. Huxley preached naturalistic chants. Huxley had a great capacity for hatred, and he loved trashing reputations and received wisdom. It says here the Pall Mall Magazine Gazette said this, that cutting up monkeys was his forte and cutting up men was his foible. He said, there is no doubt I have had a bad, a hot, bad temper. If I hate a man, I despise him. And he aimed the full force of that temper at Bible believers. He was a parson hater. Huxley said of scientists who resisted Darwinianism, I should like to get my heel into their mouths and scrunch it around. And scrunch it around. These English guys sound like wimps anyway. I'd be real scared of that. Anyway, I'm sorry. I know. I shouldn't, but I can't help it. I just think about that accent and him saying that, and I would like scrunch it around. I'm like, okay, great. Sounds, I'm, that's scary. <laughs> exactly. That's that's what I get from that. I'm sorry. That's the sound of it. That's the sound of oh, that's that's supposed to be that, brother Paul. That must have been a scary thing back there to put your heel into somebody's mouth and scrunch it around. I don't. Anyway, sorry. Victorian memoirs and memories. The Quarterly Review, 1923, cited for Ian Taylor in the minds of men. Of Richard Owen, one of the scientists holding out against Darwinianism, Huxley said this, Before I have done with that mendacious humbug, 
Wow, that's a cool word, mendacious. Anyway, that mendacious, I don't know what it means, but it sounds cool. Mendacious humbug, I will nail him out like a kite to a barn door. (laughs) An example to all evildoers. Wow, where, where's their open-mindedness and enlightenment? I thought, where's the, where's the love? And Owen was not even a true Bible believer. His Christian faith was very liberal. Of anyone who attempted to defend the Bible at any level, even those compromisers who were trying to reconcile it with evolution, Proud Huxley said that if he were commander-in-chief in the universe, he would dump them in a hot locust on the lower regions. In the lower regions. Thus, the man who mocked the idea of a God of judgment would send men to hell, would have sent his own enemies to such a place if he had power. What an unmitigated hypocrisy that is. You see how they're so double-minded? They just, they just, you can't use Bible things if you don't want, if you don't believe it's real. Huxley intended to take control of science in England, and he was largely successful. He founded the Secretive X Club, which was dedicated to science pure and free and untrammeled by religious dogmas. Opponents were locked out, ignored, and mocked. Huh, huh, yeah, kind of like the gay 90s. <laughs> that was really a weird place to preach last night. I've never preached to so many men in dresses. Or in big scary wigs. Or in really horrible looking makeup. No, that's just how they dress. I had to, I'm sorry, I did walk up to somebody, I did say, what are you? I, I really wanted to know what they were, because I couldn't tell. I was like, what are you? I'm a man in drag. Scary. That's evolution for you. Anyway, so Darwin's club was called, or not Darwin, excuse me, Huxley's club was called, the X club was called Exalted. That was a nickname for it. It consisted of nine members who, with one exception, were all presidents and secretaries of learned societies. The one exception was Herbert Spencer, whom we shall meet in the final chapter. These nine were men at the top of their profession, handpicked for their views and holding personal influence on almost every famous scientist in the world, as well as on many distinguished radicals. There, there is not, you are not allowed to be independent. There is no independence in science. There isn't. You're not allowed to be independent. The members met for dinner always immediately before each meeting of the Royal Society at which time strategy was plotted. By this means, British science was literally governed from 1864 until 1884 by Huxley and his disciples and with their combined influence over the scientific press. They controlled the press too. That sounds familiar. This is how Huxley controlled science, though. This is where the Gestapo comes in. From X-Club ranks came three presidents of the Royal Society and five presidents of the British Association. Cambridge biology teacher Michael Pittman observes this. It is certain that the gay and conspiratorial X-Club, which was strongly evolutionist in character, not only influenced the appointments made for senior positions in the newly formed universities of the Victorian era, but also, until its demise in the 1890s, practically controlled the business of the Royal Society. Adam and Evolution, page 64. What is he saying? In other words, they controlled everything that went out in, the, in public, in, in publicity, everything. They controlled everything. Why? Because they were the rich, white elite. Sound familiar? And what are the rich, white elite? Luciferians. Masons. The X Club published its own periodical called Nature as part of their aggressive campaign of selling Darwinianism to the public. As of 2009, Nature was still standing true to its founding vision. In January of that year, Nature published a free online packet titled 15 Evolutionary Gems. One report observed that it might have been substituted at, subtitled an evangelism packet for those wishing to spread the good news about Darwinianism. What's the good news? If you're black, you need to die. If you're minority, you need to die. Survival of the fittest, natural selection. I wonder if they put in there an article about Columbine, the fruit of Darwinianism, the fruit of natural selection. Klebold, one of the boys, Klebold, he had on his shirt. What did he have on it? Natural selection. And he believed it, by the way. Because in his writings, in, his, in the, email, or the messages they found in him or whatever, the letters were, he was talking about it. They talked about natural selection. He, he spoke about it. 
when he was killing people. And hey, guess what? He hated Christians too because he went up and killed a girl because she said she was a Christian. Are you a follower of Christ? Yep, boom. Well, that's evolution for you. Evil. The packet urged scientists and their institutions to spread the word that evolution is an established fact. The back page of the packet featured a glorification of Darwin consisting of a mythical picture of an attractive young Darwin, contrary to the reality, surrounded harmoniously by all sorts of animals and plant life. What is he, Rip Van Winkle now? Darwin appears almost like the god of nature. Science became the new religion and scientists the new priests. There was one Catholic apostolic church of true knowledge. In comes the Darwinian Gestapo now. Pope Huxley and his fellow bishops in the Church of Science, I like that, brought back the Inquisition by disallowing challenges to evolutionary doctrine and excommunicating those who dared to question it. Consider St. George Myvert, who was excommunicated from the Church of Science, Darwin's church. It's basically, he's just talking about evolution. He started out as an ardent evolutionist and a disciple of Huxley, but he was savaged when he had the audacity to publish a book debunking Darwinism and warning that it would destroy morality and produce despair. Got to get rid of him. Huxley inquisitors had Myvert's membership in the prestigious Athenium Club nixed. Myvert was shunned as a leper by the Darwinian elite, and he wasn't even a Bible believer. He was a liberal Roman Catholic who held the theistic evolution. Myvert was only the first victim of Darwinian Inquisition, a phenomenon that has broadened in scope and intensity in our day. Richard Milton, a science journalist, published a book in 1981 debunking Darwinian evolution and subsequently became the target of the Darwinian Gestapo. In his review of Milton's Shattering the Myths of Darwinianism, Oxford University atheist Richard Dawkins who never had an original idea, by the way, devoted two-thirds of the review to attacking the publisher for daring to print a book criticizing Darwinianism. And the author, third, and the other third of the book, assassinating Milton's character. Dawkins said the book is loony, stupid, drivel, and referred to Milton as a harmless fruitcake who needs psychiatric help. Never Never dealt with the facts at all. Nope. Nope. Dawkins has tried to have Milton blacklisted so that his scientific writings cannot be published. He has lied about him, calling him a secret creationist. He was successful in having the Times Higher Educational Supplement stop publication of one of Milton's articles. Milton observes, there is a strong streak of intellectual arrogance and intellectual authoritarianism running through the history of Darwinism. From Huxley and Charles Darwin through to Julian Huxley. We'll talk about him. Shattering the myths of Darwinianism. In 2007, astronomer Gonzalez, author of The Privileged Planet, was denied tenure at Iowa State University in spite of his excellent record because he believes in intelligent design. Hmm. In Slaughter of the Dissidents, Jerry Bergman, uh, uh, a professor in in human biology from Columbia Pacific University and Ph.D. in measurement and evaluations from Wayne State University, tells the shocking truth about killing the careers of Darwin doubters. In the introduction... He says this, in this fascinating book, Dr. Jerry Bergman himself, a victim, chronicles the history of modern religious persecution in America. A highly respected, credentialed, and published professor, he was denied tenure and subsequently fired immediately because of his creationist belief in writings. Dr. Bergman describes numerous other cases, often concealing names to protect those who do not wish, wish to risk losing their current positions as common means of persecuting those with minority views. What is this? This is the Darwinian Gestapo. Why? Because they don't want you to tell the truth about Darwinian evolution. Because it's their religion, it's their faith. Bergman testifies this, a factor that, listen to this, a factor that moved me to the creation side was the underhanded, often totally unethical techniques that evolutionists typically used to suppress dissonant, dissonant ideas, primarily creationism. Rarely did they carefully and objectively examine the facts, but usually focused on suppression of creationists, denial of their degrees, denial of their tenor, ad hominem attacks, and in general, irrational attacks on their person. In short, their response in general was totally unscientific and one that reeks of intolerance, even hatred. He wrote, Persuaded by the Evidence, chapter 4. So what's going on here? Well, the same thing that Darwin's bulldog started, that's still going on. Why do you think they're scared to debate men like Kent Hovind and other men like that? 
Why, are, why do you think they're scared to debate and talk to those men like that? These big name guys won't do that. They won't. Why won't they? Because evolution cannot hold up to scrutiny. It cannot. It becomes a faith based religion. And then you have to examine the faith. And hey, they're allowed to believe whatever they want to. They just aren't allowed for me to. I don't have to pay for it, though. I shouldn't have to, my tax money should not be going to pay for their belief. Right? That's right. It's a state religion. Walt Brown, who has a Ph.D. in me- mechanical engineering. By the way, I have a book from him, Walt Brown. Do you have that book, that big book from Walt Brown? I've got, I might have an extra copy of that. I wonder if I do, but it's huge. He's got some interesting stuff in it. Anyway, but Walt Brown, who has a Ph.D. in mechanical engineering from MIT, describes the way that evolutionists have controlled the scientific field since the day of Thomas Huxley. He uses the field of geology as an example. He says this, professors in the new and growing field of geology were primarily selected from those who supported the anti catastrophe principle. These professors did not advance students who espoused catastrophes. An advocate of a global flood was branded a biblical literalist or fuzzy thinker, not worthy of an academic degree. Geology professors also influenced through the peer review process what papers could be published. Textbooks soon reflected their orthodoxy, so few students became fuzzy thinkers. This practice continues to this day because a major criterion for selecting professors is the number of their publications. See how they're the Gestapo, they control everything? Some Darwinists have even hinted at or openly called for the imprisonment of creationists. That's right. Richard Dawkins has written that anyone who denies evolution is either ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked. But I'd rather not consider that, he said, April 9, 1989. It isn't a big step from calling someone wicked to, tell, to taking for, forceful measures to put an end to their wickedness. I mean, that's what these people will do, right? If they have a chance to put an end to our wickedness, they call wickedness. See how good is called evil and evil is called good? John Maddox, the editor of Nature, has written in his journal that it may not be long before the practice of religion must be regarded as anti-science. Defending science against anti-science, he says in page 368. In his recent book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, philosopher Daniel Dennett compares religious believers, 90% of the population, to wild animals who may have, had to, be, who may have to be caged. And he says that parents should be prevented, presumably by coercion, from misinforming their children about the truth of evolution, which is so evident to him. Yep. What is he saying? Deny God. That's what he's saying. This, this is the Gestapo. Do you understand? Are you starting to see this? How long before they have the force of the gun to do this, right? The force of the sword to do this. No, you are. What do they do to you? No, you are going to vaccinate your kid. You are going to teach evolution. You are going to do all these things. You are going to accept transgenderism. Why? Because you accepted ev- evolution in America a long time ago. That's why. And this is, by the way, I'm going to show you the next hour who invented the name transgender. Who invented that? Julian Huxley. So we do it by the force of a gun, right? No, you're going to do it, right? You're going to do it. How far are we away from that? Just make sure it's a big one. Make sure you don't miss. Huxley used deceitful art to accomplish his influence and control over science. Deceitful art has been a major vehicle for the promotion of evolution. From its inception, Huxley was guilty of this. Like Ernest Haeckel, Huxley doctored his evolutionary charts, the front piece of zoology ev- zoological evidences as to man's place in nature, featuring a drawing comparing four ape skeletons with a human one. The gibbon was drawn twice its normal size. All four of the apes are depicted standing up, which is not their natural position, and the man is stooped, which is also unnatural. This was done to make it look more feasible at a glance that the ape could evolve into man, and it is a lie. And it's stupid. That's right. Homo ignoramus. That's right. Far more people have been influenced by the mythical evolutionary artwork than by the evolutionary writings themselves. Well, because most people don't read anymore. They just look at pictures. Oh, look at the pictures. (laughs) We look at the pictures. I believe it. Look, it's right there. I believe it. See, there's a good drawing of it. Look at it. 
Right, exactly. You can't show evolution. You can't prove evolution. So you've got to doctor up a bunch of photos. Right? Right. So they doctored the photos and made the apes look more human and the human look more apes. Like apes. Why? So they could push their agenda and it worked. It worked brilliantly. Because I talk to people all the time on the street and I'm like, you really think you came from a monkey? Seriously though, you really think you came from a monkey? Like really? Yeah. Mario and Louis, I don't know. Don't, don't remind me of those guys. Bad dreams about Mario and Luigi. Something was changing in England at the time. His biographer describing him as an evolutionary propagandist and proselyzer of the new scientific authority. He was a revolutionist. When Huxley was young, Darwinianism was largely rejected in the halls of science and by the Church of England. But by the time Huxley was old, Charles Darwin was honored by a burial in Westminster Abbey, and his statue was placed in the most prominent place in the British Museum of Natural History. When Huxley was young, Unitarian skeptic Joseph Priestley was widely condemned and his views soundly rejected. But by 1874, a statue was raised in Birmingham to honor the heretic, and Huxley presided over its dedication. Just like You couldn't even make this up. In the 1850s, the theological modernism of essays and reviews was roundly condemned by Anglican priests and leaders, including the Bishop of Oxford, and some of the modernists were condemned in ecclesiastical courts. But by the 1880s, the modernists were in positions of authority everywhere, and the Bible believers were being persecuted. What Huxley wrote against the Bible in the 1880s, no decent magazine would have dared to publish 30 years before. When Robert Cecil, Chancellor of Oxford University, honored Darwin in 1894 and praised the revolution he brought to England. Listen to this. Listen to this. Huxley remarked to his fellow pioneer in skepticism, Joseph Hooker. He said this. Huxley said this. Now listen. He said, it was very queer to sit there and hear the doctrines that you and I were damned for advocating 34 years ago at Oxford, enunciated as matters of course, disputed by no reasonable man. Well, yeah, they were rejoicing. He said, man, this is really eerie. 30 years ago, these guys would have ran me out of town. Now they're honoring us and building statues for us. Yep. Huxley realized that education was the key to the promotion of evolution and the overthrow of the Bible in men's hearts. That was his goal. How to break the hold of the sermon? He said, get science into the classroom, Huxley answered. At first, he first advocated using the Bible in schools after removing everything that men of science disagree with. That would be a small Bible. David Cloud says, it reminds me of the positive Bible, which removes everything that is negative. It's a very thin book. (laughs) Yeah. Later, Huxley called for the removal of the Bible from classrooms entirely. Well, of course. I cer- you certainly can't have this in the classroom with Darwinian evolution because this would prove it wrong. This has life and truth and spirit. And we wouldn't want that competing with soup and death. Right? Huxley and Darwin both believe that a moral code can be maintained if, even if one rejects God and believes in naturalistic evolution. Huxley proclaimed that though man descended from brutes, he, assuredly, he, he is assuredly not of them. There's that double-mindedness again. Wait a minute. How, can't, how can a man not be of them if he ascend, descended from them or ascended from them? Or descended from them. How, how could he not? That's... Surely he descended from brutes, but he's not of them. This guy was doing some crazy drugs. If there is no law-giving creator, God, there is no basis for absolute morality. If a man is a product of blind forces of nature, he is no better than an animal, and there is no ultimate reason why he should not act out in any and every impulse. And what do they do? That's why we walked outside. That's why we were outside of that queer bar last night, preaching outside there, and there were a bunch of men dressed as women running around like women. Mad as the devil at us. Mm -hmm. Why? Because there's no rules. There's no God. There's no rules. There's no truth. 
In fact, Huxley lived to despise his nihilistic culture that he helped create. By the way, he did cre- they did create that culture, him and Darwin and their evolution, created this culture of no restraint, primed the pump and made it ready for Aleister Crowley and others to come along. Darwin's biographer Jacques Barzin said this, he was trying to slay the ghost he had raised but lacked the formula. Well, I can help you out. The ghost you raised was nothing more than a spirit, the spirit of Satan, okay, and devils. And the only way to defeat that is Jesus Christ the Lord. He knew exactly how to slay it, but he sinned against his own conscience in the light of his own conscience, in the light of creation, he sinned against it. Amen? And he is without excuse. Listen to what happened to him, though. One evening, the uh, flamboyant homosexual Oscar Wilde came to the 60-year-old Huxley's house with a coterie of his daughter Nettie's self-obsessed hedonist, artsy friends. (laughs) Wilde came with his risque quips, projecting all the petulances and flippancies of the decadence and febrile self-assertions of voluptuousness, the perversity of the new hedonism. Huxley responded, that man never enters my home again. So what basically, let me translate it in modern terms. This dude came flaming into his house like a fruit, okay? And he looked at me and was like, whoa, what are you doing here and what are you anyway? And he was flaming hardcore, acting like a woman. I mean, just, just being just a, a rabid homosexual there. And, and he got scared and Huxley's like, whoa, that's pretty scary. Don't let that guy back in my house. Yep. Well, you just let those people into the world. You just gave them reason. You gave them authority to do what they do. Why do you think he wanted to hang out with you? Because you denied the God of the Bible. That's right, they worshipped him. Both Darwin and Huxley were faithful husbands and moralists. Neither liked flaming homosexuals and moral decadence. But the divorce plague and homosexual rights and legalized abortion and the pornography revolution are direct products of their evolutionary principles and religious skepticism. You own it. That's right. That's a good one, Russ. <laughs> Barzin observed that Huxley's views left him in his world naked before moral adversity, and Huxley died heavy hearted with forebodings of the kind of future he had helped to prepare. Wicked hypocrite. In 1893, Huxley boasted. Boasting wrote this, history records that whatever science and orthodoxy have been fairly opposed, the latter has been forced to retire from the list, bleeding and crushed, if not annihilated, scotched, and if not slain. Before Huxley died, he said he would rather go to hell than be annihilated. He said, it is a curious thing that I find my dislike to the thought of extinction increasing as I get older and near the goal. It flashes across me at all sorts of times with a sort of horror that in 1900 I shall probably know no more of what is going on than I did in 1800. I had sooner be in hell, at any rate, in any of the upper circles where the climate and company are not too trying. Well, Huxley, there is no cool part of hell. Okay, the climate doesn't change. It's hot and hotter. There's only one weather report in hell. Black and hot. That's it. That's right. That's right. He became increasingly depressed and nihilistic. A death shroud descended over Huxley's philosophy. He and Darwin believed that mankind was destined to perish in a final universal winter when the universe ceased to sustain life. Okay, I got to hurry. I'm almost done here. But in her old age, Huxley's wife, in her old age, Huxley's wife, Nettie, remember her, was lapping on the edges of agnosticism herself. This was a result of disobeying God and becoming unequally yoked with an unbeliever. She was plagued by questions such as these: Do we all just shrivel up? Does destiny lie in some sun? S U N, not S O N. What is the good of it all? The great questions of life are answered plainly in the Bible, a book that gives every evidence of being what it claims to be, which is the infallible word of God. When men and women reject the light of the Bible, they are left to wander in gross darkness and confusion. Nothing is worth losing one's faith over. Jesus wisely asked, what what does a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So insanity and demonic depression 
was the end of his life, and we're done here, but uh, that's the end, that was the end of his life. Why? Well, when you mess with devils and you deny the God of the Bible, that's what you're going to end up with. Insanity and depression, listen to this, ran deeply in the skeptical Huxley family. Huxley's father died in a insane asylum. The fruit doesn't look very good here, does it? His two brothers suffered extreme mental anxiety and near madness. Thomas himself had many debilitating bouts with deep depression, periods when he was unable to face the world and a deadness hangs about me. He was said to carry a strain of madness in him. It's called the devil, so you know. And to carry on lengthy conversations between unknown persons living within his brain. Well, what's that? Yeah, he, yeah, well, that's the evolutionary answer for it. He needed medication. My, my, yeah, the gospel, that's right. He needs a pill, the gospel, that's right. You, you know what he needed? He needed some devils out of him. That's what he needed. He needed to be born again. He needed Jesus Christ to forgive his sins, but he rejected the Christ, the Bible, and he left with no hope. Huxley's daughter, Maddie, was troubled by mental illness for years, prey to gloom and horrors before her death in her mid-20s. She hardly knew her three-year-old. She died in near madness and despair, desperately wanting to believe in another happier world that shall make up for all the cruelties of this world. Her own father's philosophy provided no comfort, no purpose, no hope, no salvation. One of Huxley's grandsons, Noel, Noel Trevelyan, committed suicide at age 25. And another, which we'll talk about next hour, Julian Huxley, suffered six mental breakdowns. I firmly believe that all those are from the devils and the rejecting of God and the sitting against their own conscience, and it tortured them. The devil used What was the devil was done with them, and what does he do? They live out the rest of their days, and they're burned out, and they hate it, and they cannot face the world. They're shriveled up. Like Aleister Crowley's last words, I am perplexed. Mm-hmm. That's right. They shrivel up and die. That's what Luciferianism does for you. That's what it does to worship the God of the Masonic Lodge. That's what it does to worship those Rosicrucian devils. That's what it does. That's what you'll end up with. You want evolution? You want the religion of evolution? You want Luciferianism repackaged in evolution? Go ahead. It, it leads to death. All they that hate God love death. And that's where it leads. Better repent. Better turn to Christ alone who can save you from your sins who can cleanse you of your unrighteousness, who can give you the hope that you don't have, who can give you that new world to come, where there'll be no sorrow there. Amen? But you need Jesus. He's the only way. Otherwise, it's back to the jungle. That's the way it goes. Father, Lord, we thank you. And Lord, we know we're exposing men like this, Lord, who hated you. But, Lord, we thank you and we love you, Lord. We want to share the truth with people. We want people to be saved. And, Lord, we want them to be saved out of this stupid, foolish, evolutionary theory. Ignorance and haters of God. Lord, I pray that you please would help us. I pray that you please would help us to spread this truth out to as many. Lord, I pray this goes everywhere, that everybody can hear this, Lord. And those that need to, they find the truth. They find the truth they've been duped. That evolution is just a mask for Luciferianism, for Satan. It's all it is. It's to reject the God of the Bible, reject your own salvation that God has offered, that Jesus Christ offered on Calvary, and that he paid for with the resurrection as well of Jesus Christ, and he gave victory through that resurrection. And, Lord, we have victory, and we will live because he lives. And, Lord, we pray that we could get that message out, that there is hope for those that are down, the drug addict, the derelict, the liar, the cheat, the stealer, the thief, the pornographer, the homosexual, the transgender, there's hope for you in Jesus Christ. The mentally uh, disabled or the, or the mentally depressed or those that are plagued, and there's hope for you in Jesus Christ. God, please help us to get that message out to the masses before it's too late. In Jesus' holy name we pray this. Amen.